Okay, good morning, global politicians. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, I hope you're staying healthy and um, safe. <laughs> Hello, Chloe. Um, there's really not space here, is there? I do. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for your feedback. Um, I did read your feedback, so thank you. Thanks to those of you who, where are you going, Chloe? who did uh, submit your feedback, um, you know, and I'll try to take into account what you said during um, the remaining lessons we have online learning. And for what it's worth as a teacher, you know, just some feedback for the class. I think we've all done brilliantly so far. Um, it has been difficult with online learning, but, you know, you've all been working. We've all been keeping largely up to date with our tasks. Um, Hello, Chloe. Is this is this really helping? Um, so thank you for that, and keep going. So in this week's lessons, we're looking at um, we're looking at pathways towards development. So first of all, we're just going to um, define sustainability. You guys are going to analyze the Brandt line, uh, which I'm going to explain in a minute, and we're going to evaluate some of the um, models of development. So we're going to look at modernization, dependency neoliberalist and the Washington consensus theory. So first of all, sustainability, this is sort of just a recap because we've essentially been looking at sustainability as one of the, uh, the things we looked at essentially last week and the week before. Um, so sustainability is, as we know, the idea that development should try to meet the needs of the present, but without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Um, and normally when we talk about sustainability, there are three sort of areas, um, environmental, social, political, and economic. And in global politics, it's important to remember that in order for political institutions and big economic actors and individuals to take a longer term view of sustainability, um, they have to have incentives in order to do so because obviously um, sustainability is is more difficult than coming up with short-term factors and um, models for development so this is just as defining it because uh, it's a key concept that we look at in this uh, chapter so first of all we're going to look at the brand line so the brand line is a line that is drawn roughly dividing north to south or as you can see that squiggles down to include um, Australia and New Zealand. And basically, you have your developed nations or your rich nations in the north, and you have your poor nations or developing nations in the south. And the Brandt Line um, is proposed in the 1980s. It's called the Brandt Line because it's the uh, named after the former Chancellor of West Germany, Willy Brandt. And his idea at the time in the 1980s was based on GDP per capita. So if you were to look at the GDP per capita, you'd have high GDP per capita here and low GDP per capita here. And he sort of thought that therefore for development, the rich countries in the north should transfer aid to the countries in the south. So what I want you to do is why is or why in 1980 was there the case where you clearly had richer nations in the north and poorer nations in the south. Is it due to political factors? Is it due to economic factors? Is it due to environmental factors? Is it due to social factors? And I mean, today we could argue that, well, China would, probably this line would include China and maybe India and maybe Japan and maybe South Korea. Um, but in 1980s, this was very much the case. So why was that the case? Why would nations in the north more developed than the south? And... Also, is the Brandt Line still relevant today? What lessons can we learn from the Brandt Line? What does it tell us about development? So that's the first thing, and you need to answer that on Google Classroom. I've posted a question. Just respond to it, okay? Um, so secondly, we're going to look at models of development. So I've created an infographic about modernization theory. And... Modernization theory is the idea that the only way for countries to develop is to follow the examples of developed Western nations who have already uh, undertaken this journey. So basically, in order to develop, you've got to do exactly the same as the Western nations did in order to develop. 
So you start from stage one where you have traditional societies. Um, a society is based on subsistence agriculture. So subsistence agriculture is the idea that you grow enough crops just to survive, just to live. You're not thinking about trade. You're not thinking about economic growth. You are thinking about having enough to feed your family for the next year. And I think with the farming simulation, you would have got an idea of how difficult that is. So your, your society has low levels of technology. You sort of have pre-scientific values, so you don't necessarily have a huge importance placed in modern healthcare or modern science and mathematical values. So to get to stage two, you need to have, um, you start to introduce money and banking into the economy. This creates a new class of entrepreneurs, you know, businessmen who are looking to make money. Um, you can have more scientific, more mathematical values. So they're the preconditions for takeoff. If you get the preconditions for takeoff, you get to stage three, which is takeoff, which is uh, where you have um, societies which you suddenly value um, encouraging economic growth. So that suddenly becomes important. You're not thinking about just surviving, you're thinking about economic growth. And you start to see growth in certain sectors. So this, your economy or your state becomes a part of a drive to maturity. So you have an economy that is diversifying. You're not just focusing on one sector. You produce an increasingly large variety of goods. Your standard of living increases, poverty decreases. So this is stage four, drive to maturity. Then we get to stage five, which is high mass consumption. So now you have a society in which you have um, widespread wealth, you have widespread production and consumption of modern consumer goods. So you start to see consumer capitalism in your country. You start to see people having disposable income and being able to spend that on um, non-essential items. So they're the five stages. Critis critics of this um, model of development have said, well, doesn't include sort of social or political or environmental development. This is all about economics. Um, and the obvious criticism of this as well is that it's incredibly ethnocentric because it's based on what happened to the Western nations. Uh, and so they'll say, well, this has got no relevance to developing countries in Africa or in Southeast Asia or in South America. This is purely based on ethnocentric um, journeys. And it's also based completely on free market consumer capitalism. Um, and so that completely uh, means that if you are not a free market capitalist nation, then you can't really develop. So what you need to do is you need to create an individual infographic based on your model of development. So Jonathan, Kevin, Rachel, Jordan, you're doing dependency theory. So you're not doing it together. You're all individually going to make an infographic on dependency theory. Sean's and Nora, you're doing neoliberalist theory. And Andin, Jean, James, you're doing Washington consensus theory. Uh, you can use any platform you want to make your infographic. You can, you know, Canva is quite good. Uh, Photoshop, you can use pages. Um, whatever you want, you can draw it by hand if you want. But when you're finished, you need to upload it to your slide. Uh, you've all got a slide with the title. Um, make sure it's in landscape. That's the only um, thing you have to make sure. Um, I've attached some materials to Google Classroom to help you with this, to help you with your research. Um, and your infographic must include a summary of the theory, sort of some explanation or stages of the theory. Who are the key thinkers? Who are the people who uh, were behind this theory? And what are the criticisms of this theory? Okay, and this may be where the critical theories that we looked at can come in. So that is your task of the week. As I said, we don't have a class on Friday. Um, and on Wednesday, our slot will be HLGPC. So as ever, if you have any questions, uh, please ask. Don't be uh, afraid to ask. And enjoy the week and make sure we have some enthusiasm. Do you want to say goodbye, Chloe? No, she's sleeping. <laughs>